Well, I appreciate everybody being here. I know it's taken some time out of your, your day to be educated on this subject, but I think it's such an important subject. I held this back in June of last year, and I had two people show up. Mm. So June's not a great time to hold workshops, I found out. Um, this is a lot better. People <coughs> coming off the new year, we all made a lot of bad dietary choices over Christmas, and New Year, and Thanksgiving. It's all kind of culminated up to this point now, and people are interested. So as you can see, uh, we have a lot more people here this time. But this is such a very, very important subject, because when we look at digestion, the title of this is Healthy Digestion, Healthy You. And people think, well, yeah, being having a healthy digestive system is part of being healthy, but it really is fairly uh, paramount in what we do. So, if, for those of you who don't know, I'm Dr. Ryan Hartman. Uh, I'm one of the chiropractors here at the office. I know a number of you. I've seen a number of you either. I, you've seen one of the other doctors and you've uh, happened to come into my room once or twice. Um, but for those of you who don't know, I'm the, the newest uh, doc here. I've been here three, a little over three years now. So. I will be the one presenting and teaching tonight. I'm going to start out with a little quote here. And the quote is uh, something that's attributed to Hippocrates, who was one of the most well-known medical doctors of all time. Even though he was of ancient times, we still talk about a lot of his work today. And he said, all diseases begin in the gut. And that's where I say health must also begin in the gut. If we're going to be truly healthy, we must look and analyze our digestive system and make sure that it's working the way that it's supposed to be. So. Brief overview, healthy digestion, healthy you. We kind of talked about that a little bit already, and we'll, I'll re-emphasize a lot of those points more as we go on as to if your digestive system's doing well, the rest of you is probably not doing that bad. Uh, we'll talk about, just gonna give a brief overview of what the gastrointestinal, you, you'll hear me say gastrointestinal, that really means your stomach and your intestines. I may call it GI, I might just refer to everything as the gut. Terminology, there, there's lots of different things that I'll, I'll say a little bit differently depending on how fast I'm talking. So uh, we'll talk about the functions of this gastrointestinal sy system. We'll talk about things that will go dysfunctional on this system. How do we assess it? Then how do we treat it? And then, like I said at the end, we'll, we'll uh, finish up some question and answer time, okay? Before we get started. This is kind of an uncomfortable topic for some people to talk about, and that's why I thought I scared most people away when I was talking about digestive health, but everyone poops. We'll talk a little bit about stools. We'll talk a little bit about some things that might not be the most comfortable to talk about, but uh, it is true, and I don't want anything to be, I don't want to say off limits here, but you know, I, I want to make sure that um, you know this is a comfortable environment. I don't want to make anybody uncomfortable. We're going to talk about some of these things. We're going to talk about them rather plainly. So. So, to get started here, what is the gastrointestinal system? Really what it is, is it's a long muscular tube. You know, there's that big coil um, and that big sac, essentially, that sits within the middle of your abdomen, your stomach, and your intestines. There's a little bit more to it than that. It really is a separation between the internal and external environments. So, anything in the digestive system is theoretically not inside of you. It's passing through a hollow tube that is, is not part of you. Again, this is all semantics, but it's supposed to keep stuff that's not supposed to be in there out and allow stuff that should be into our bodies in. Uh, and it also just kind of helps, to, it has a, a propelling type of effect with those muscles, just kind of forces and pushes everything down uh, <coughs> towards its final destination. So it breaks things down mechanically, but also chemically. And we'll talk about some of the mechanical secretions and how they can go wrong. Uh, we'll talk about absorption. We have micronutrients, like uh, our different elements, our iron, um, magnesium, you know, some of those types of things. But then we have more macronutrients, which would be like our fats and, and our proteins and our carbohydrates. So those are the things that we need to be able to live. The real function of the gastrointestinal system, when we think about it, is food. Food in and energy out. Um, one of the main problems with, that we see with why people are having digestive disturbances and a host of other problems that we'll talk about tonight is that are we really eating food anymore? If you look at a lot of the food labels, and, and this isn't a food class, this isn't necessarily a diet class, but this is so paramount to understanding this system. So, um, again, are we eating real food? Uh, there's some great resources that I'll talk about at the end, and this is uh, Dr. Alejandro Younger, and he says the problem is that we are not eating food anymore. We're eating food-like substances, things that look like food. We package them up in a nice little... Uh, box you throw the, the oven and comes out and you're like, man, this tastes good too. But if you look at the food label and the ingredients, you don't recognize half those things. It's reconstituted 
pulled apart from different foods and all shoved together to look like something familiar. Um, and again, it's a big problem today. Um, genetically modified organisms. Uh, this is, again, a, a huge subject to go into, but I'm sure uh, most of you have probably heard some about GMOs or genetically modified organisms. Uh, and actually, we have a physician in the area, uh, Dr. Arden Anderson. I just have his little primer book that he wrote, but this is the actual book, and it's called Food Plague. And what it's about is it is about GMO foods and what are they doing. He's done a lot of research, a lot of studying. He's a very intelligent man. He lectures all over the world, uh, and I trust what he says. So he's talking about how the genetically modified foods are really not what we need to be eating. And you're seeing more and more now non-GMO labels on foods, which is a good thing. That way you can make a, an educated decision when you are buying food at the grocery store. So, back into the digestive system though, I know I took a little bit of a detour there. Like I said, it's a barrier. I think of it as being a wall around a city. You think, of it, is it a strong wall or is it a weak wall? Are there holes in that wall? This is where the digestive system can, be, can begin to break down uh, and cause a lot of other problems just other than just, oh, my stomach kind of hurts, or I have a little constipation, diarrhea, bloating, indigestion. Um, it is the home to microflora. Microflora are those bacteria that live within our digestive system. The amazing thing is, if we count up all the cells in our body, the flora in our intestines outnumbers all of our own cells 10 to 1. That's amazing. I think it's like four, 2 to 4 pounds of bacteria just sitting in our digestive system. That's, <laughs> and when you think about it like that, you're like, wow, we have a lot of visitors down there. So, <laughs> we look at levels of the digestive system. We have primary organs, which are your stomach and your, your small intestine, your large intestine, but then we also have accessory organs. And digestion starts at the mouth. It starts with how well are you chewing your food? How well are you able to secrete digestive enzymes and saliva into your, uh, into your mouth so you can start that chemical breakdown here so when it hits your stomach, the process is a whole lot easier. Um, the pharynx hits back the pharynx, it goes down the esophagus, next thing you know it's in, into the stomach. We also have three accessory organs. We'll talk about these a lot more because they're very, very important. Liver, gallbladder, and pancreas. The reason I have this slide up here is, again, kind of give you a gross overview of what the digestive system looks like. But even more importantly than that is this, is that each section of the digestive system has a specialized cell wall. They all do different functions. We'll talk about those functions as we continue on. Um, and I'll show you pictures a little bit more in depth. This is a very important concept about the digestive system that we'll keep on coming back and we'll talking about it, keep talking about it as the night goes on. It's like a stream. So you think about it, or a river. It's like there's an upstream and there's a downstream. Whatever you do upstream is going to affect you downstream. So there will be a lot of things, like when we start talking about colon dysfunction, well, stomach can cause problems there, small intestines can cause problems there, gallbladder, pancreas, and everything can cause problems in there. Whereas the stomach, you know, there's only a few things that can affect that because it's an upstream-downstream relationship. So, we're just going to jump right in here. We're going to talk about the stomach. What does the stomach really do? Well, you know that thing that kind of gargles and kind of tosses and turns a little bit when you're a little nervous, but really what the stomach does is it has three muscular layers that are important for mixing food together. But it, the most important thing that it really does is it, it secretes acid. Acid, uh, hydrochloric acid that will sterilize our food, kill a lot of bacteria that comes in through um, our digestive system. Um, it will help to digest the food. It'll start to break down. A strong acid will break down the proteins as well as acidify what we call the bolus, that mass of food as it starts to pass into the small intestines, which is very important because acidic conditions of that bolus, that mass of food, need to be there or else the gall gallbladder doesn't sec secrete what it needs to and the pancreas doesn't secrete what it needs to. That leads to a whole host of problems. The stomach also uh, produces intrinsic factor. Without intrinsic factor, you can absorb vitamin B12, uh, which can cause a whole host of problems. So stomach, very, very important. Here's a, a kind of a gross picture of it, and you see the three muscular layers, so it just kind of tosses your food back and forth until it gets all nice and mixed up, all the while mixing up with that acid. And then um, these are the different cells. We have chief cells, gastric cells, parietal cells, mucus cells. These cells are all producing different um, hormones. They're producing the hydrochloric acid, and they're also secreting mucus because there's a whole mucus layer on this that helps to protect it. You imagine, and some of you may be very much too aware of this is that when acid touches an area of your digestive system that it shouldn't be, it hurts. You get that heartburn type of sensation or you get an ulcer type of a sensation. Um, that's what the mucus is so very important for and that all sections of our digestive system secrete mucus for protection. 
we have the duodenum and the pancreas. Duodenum is a big fancy name for the initial section of the small intestine. That's where a lot of secretions get dumped in to um, the intestine. So this is where we start to have chemical breakdown of fats, proteins, and carbohydrates. But that acid, if you imagine if we passed acid all the way through our digestive system, that would not be at all comfortable. So it also releases what we call bicarbonate, which neutralizes the acid. Some people, if their pancreas isn't working very well, it doesn't neutralize that acid and they start developing ulcers. This is a big blown up picture of what that whole complex system looks like here. And again, we see liver, gallbladder, and we see the pancreas. They all kind of work together here. And you see they actually share a lot of common openings. Pancreas, they dump through this, um, uh, it dumps its secretions into the small intestine area here, as does the gallbladder and liver through the gallbladder. You might say liver, what does liver have to do with digestion? Well, it has a lot to do with digestion because liver takes and detoxifies junk that comes into our body. The first place after it's absorbed into the body, it goes it, through the digestive system is it goes through the liver. The liver detoxifies it and cleans it. It dumps it back into the gallbladder, into the bile, so that it can be eliminated and dumped out of the body. So it creates bile. The gallbladder then concentrates bile, which is what we'll talk about here. But another important thing is that the liver also detoxifies. I do a whole hour-long class on detoxification that we're not going to go into it that in-depthly today. So um, you can watch that on our, our um, YouTube channel. You can find it there, okay? Gallbladder. The bile is very important, like I said, for getting rid of toxins, but also the bile helps to break down fats. So. Um, a lot of toxins are fat soluble. That's why this, this whole uh, relationship between all these organs works so well. Um, and then it's also very important for <coughs> absorbing fat soluble vitamins. You think about vitamins A, D, and K, those are all our fat soluble vitamins. If you won't have a good functioning gallbladder, you're not going to be digesting those vitamins and then absorbing them into your system. Small intestine, these are the, the divisions here. Like I said, duodenum, jejunum, and the ileum. The big thing you need to know about this is this is where there's a lot more digestive enzymes that are secreted, and this is where the majority of the absorption takes place within our body, is in the small intestine of, of actual nutrients. When we get to the colon, that's where we see absorption of water and the electrolytes. This is, uh, like I said, each section of the, the digestive system is specialized. The cells are specialized. This is just amazing to me, so I put the picture in because I like to show it to people. We look at the wall of the digestive system here in the small intestine, and there's these little fingers that all stick off of it. But even off of these little fingers, there's even smaller fingers. What this does is it allows for maximum surface area so that uh, as much food as possible can be absorbed. But in somebody that, say, has like celiac disease, all of a sudden these little microvilli, they aren't there anymore. You don't have that digestive ability because of inflammation. We'll talk about some of those consequences a little bit more later on. So, like I said, the colon absorbs water, it absorbs electrolytes, and that's also the storage place. Until it's time to have a bowel movement, that's where it sits. At least that's where it should sit. So, this just gives a brief overview. Um, like I said, we start up at the top, we get to the stomach, we have a lot of digestive secretions that are dumped in at that very first part of the intestines, and then it goes through and that's where we start to get food absorbed. Uh, and like I said, water absorbed, and then finally, it's eliminated. So, what happens when this process doesn't work the way it's supposed to? A lot of people have the, the uh, they suppose, well, like, well, it's, it's not a big deal, it's just my digestive system, but it's huge, and we'll talk about all the little, well, we won't talk about all of them, we'll talk about a few of the major hands that the digestive system kind of reaches in and touches around the body, okay? Everybody has uh, a metabolic assessment form, um, that we're going to go through and talk about. And there's different sections to this metabolic assessment form, and it will give you information as to, um, it gives, I should say, the clinician, whoever's uh, working with you, information as to what areas might need to be targeted for therapy. So as we go through, we'll, we'll talk about some of the, the dysfunctions here. I realized I realized I handed all of them out, I believe. Thank you. I appreciate that. I'll get you two at the end. So, as we go through here, I'll point out what section we're talking about um, as we go through. Because as you see, they're not labeled. And they're not, not labeled for a reason. Because somebody says, well, I know I have pancreas problems, and all of a sudden they're circling threes all over the place. We don't need that. So, Common gastrointestinal conditions that aren't necessarily life-threatening. You know, we start to get things like cancers, 
That's, that's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about more, we say, functional diseases. So food allergies and sensitivities, and we'll talk a little bit about how those things develop. Celiac disease, uh, stomach acidity issues, people that have gastroesophageal reflux or just, you know, they get reflux, they get um, um, heartburn. Dysbiosis, which is a big word for you have a lot of bad bacteria and not very much good bacteria in your intestines. We'll talk about leaky gut syndrome. Like I said, detoxification issues are a big problem. We're not going to talk a lot about them today. Gallbladder stasis, pancreatic dysfunction, autoimmunity that occurs within the gastrointestinal system, um, inflammatory bowel disease, and then also irritable bowel as well. So these are some common things that people deal with that uh, we just kind of deal with. It's not necessarily a, a lot of those things we, we don't treat very well. We just kind of mask symptoms, but there are ways to naturally go about and treat these things. So stomach. This is going to be in our category four and category five. So you can read through some of those different symptoms that can be associated here. Uh, belching, offensive breath, sense of fullness during and after meals, um, stomach pain using antacids. Uh, you know, a lot of the things that we would see with somebody who deals with heartburn. And that's essentially what we're looking at there. But there's two different categories there because there's hyperacidity and there's hypoacidity, which we'll talk about right now. There's hypochlorohydria, which is too little stomach acid, and there's hyperchlorohydria, which is too much. A lot of people think that their heartburn is due to too much stomach acid. In many cases, it's because there's too little and the proteins aren't being broken down appropriately. So they putrefy, they get rancid essentially, and proteins are made up of teeny, teeny tiny little acids. So what happens when they break down, they become very acidic. They start breaking down the intestinal lining uh, and your stomach lining as well. So it's not always a hyperacidity problem. And one of the, the problems that causes this in the United States is this little bacterium we see down here. It's called Helicobacter pylori. And it actually goes and it shuts down a lot of the secretions within your stomach. Not a good thing to be dealing with. And you know we're covering this up with a lot of prescription antacids. Um, when a lot of times people are like, you know, I took an antibiotic and my heartburn went away. Well, maybe you have a bacterial, or maybe it's just functional at that point. Uh, but we can have hyperacidity too, where people do produce excess, um, and that is what eventually will pass into the small intestines and can produce ulcers in the stomach and in the small intestine. Um, duodenum in the pancreas. What are some things that can happen? Um, hypochlorohydria, so stomach problems. Or if you have a chronic gastrointestinal infection, can start to affect the small intestines and the pancreas. The big problem with this, and I, I expand on this a little bit more, because you're not going to you're not going to secrete as many enzymes, which means you're not going to uh, digest your food, which means you're going to eat food and you're not going to feel well. You're not going to feel like you actually got nutrients into your body and you feel like you're fueled. Um, you can produce large fatty stools, which is one of the things that is uh, listed here under category um, six. Uh, and those are all things that people can experience when they have pancreatic dysfunction. Again, not like you have uh, pancreatic cancer or anything like that, but just it's not working as well as it could be. Um, and then pancreatitis can happen, which is inflama inflammation of the pancreas, can happen when there's a gallstone, but people who chronically abuse alcohol as well, this can be, become a problem for them as well, on top of dealing with cirrhosis of the liver. Speaking of liver, common causes of dysfunction, overwhelming the detoxification pathways, which is pretty much the lifestyles that we expose our ourselves to these days, is not at all the lifestyle that we had, say, even 100 years ago, say, let's say 2,000 years ago, would be completely different. Um, so we've just opened ourselves up to a lot of convenience, but at the same time, a lot of junk. So again, I don't have time to go into a lot of it, but that's category eight there, where it starts to talk about um, acne and unhealthy skin, um, excessive hair loss, overall sense of bloating, bodily swelling for no reason, hormone imbalances, weight gain, excessive foul smelling sweat, poor bowel um, function. Those are all things that can be associated with poor detoxification ability. The gallbladder. A high fat diet can affect it because the gallbladder is just like, oh my gosh, I'm so tired. You fed me so much fat, I can't even emulsify it anymore. That emulsification process I kind of skipped over earlier, what it does is it breaks the fats down into little teeny tiny pieces and then surrounds them so that it looks like it's, it's more um, water soluble. Usually, fats of course are fat soluble. They don't absorb very well across our digestive system. So. High fat diet can become a problem here. Estrogen dominance, uh, dominance can become a problem here. And then hypochlorohydria, again, what's upstream can start to affect what's downstream. Um, what can happen though, sometimes, and especially this is common with people that deal with hypothyroid, is that they get biliary stasis. What that means is the gallbladder, it should contract when there's a meal, 
and squeeze some of that bile out to emulsify the fats, but sometimes it just contracts so slow that by the time it finally does that, food's already passed by, it's not being digested, and um, estrogen dominance can affect this, uh, but also, like I said, hypothyroidism can affect this pretty significantly as well. Uh, and that's all listed in category seven. So we, you see right there, first thing, greasy or high fat foods causing distress. Uh, lower bowel gas or bloating several hours after eating because by this time it takes a little bit of time to get the food down there. Um, and you can read through some of the other ones here. But at the very end it says, have you had your gallbladder removed? There's a number of people that consider the gallbladder is just a accessory organ that you really don't need. But that couldn't be further from the truth because you imagine that reservoir of bile as opposed to the liver's like, oh, I guess I have to make some because there's some fat coming down. Uh, as opposed to it, it kind of has a little bit of a storage ability with this nice gallbladder sac here. But um, people that have had their gallbladders removed, it's very important to do some sort of supplementation to support liver so that the liver is producing enough um, bile, but then also uh, so that the gallbladder that's not there anymore uh, will function even though it's, it's not there. It, there's a little cystic duct that takes over here and, and helps out. So, um, like I said, it's not a necessary organ. It's very important, so try everything you can to try and not get that taken out. Let's just put it that way. And if you do, like I said, supplement afterwards. Small intestines, what are some problems we can have here? Celiacs, food allergies, common use of antibiotics can start to break this down. Frequent use of medications can start to break this down. Um, inflammation, chronic stress, and alcohol abuse. Um, and symptoms associated with this dysfunction uh, we see in category two. Uh, and this specifically looks at leaky gut syndrome. So we start to look at things like increased frequency of food reactions. You're like, man, I eat this food and my ears start to feel like they get full or my sinuses start to get really full or my nose starts to run. I get this kind of wheeze in my, my chest. <coughs> Or um, a big one, probably the most telltale sign that you maybe have a problem with leaky gut is that you get bloating after meals, um, which I believe that's in here somewhere. But um, aches, pains, and swelling throughout the body, unpredictable abdominal swelling, frequent, there you go, frequent bloating and distension after eating, uh, and abnormal uh, abdominal intolerance to starches and sugars, because that's where a lot of this absorption starts to take place. So leaky gut syndrome. This is a big problem in my mind, so we're going to spend a little bit of time on this. Um, you, you saw some of the, the uh, associations, some of the symptoms that can oftentimes go along with this. Uh, what really happens here is there's a breakdown in that gut barrier. Like I said, we can either have a strong wall or we can have a weak wall that has a lot of holes in it. When we talk about holes, I'm not meaning like you have this huge gaping hole in your digestive system, but little pores. I mean, you think about the food that you eat and you take it and it's all digested down to all these small particles. It then needs to be absorbed across the digestive system. But sometimes undigested particles can come across and all of a sudden your body's like, what is this? This isn't an amino acid or a fatty acid or a carbohydrate or a trace mineral. And so what it does then is that it starts to tag it and it says, immune system, we don't know what this is, take care of it. And your immune system comes in, it mounts in what we call an antibody response, much like if you had an infection. And it goes in and it gobbles that thing up and it says, all right, we got it taken care of. And it says, if we see that again, we're going to jump right on it. You don't even have to tell us anymore. We're just going to go in there. We're going to get it. No big deal. Um, I'm jumping a little bit ahead of myself here. I'm giving you the whole story. So when we're exposed to that food again, we eat it, and the body just automatically says, we got to take care of this. This is a problem. There's an invader in here trying to get us. goes in, and it starts to cause an immune reaction, inflammatory reaction. Okay, That's really kind of the process, and we'll see that here broken down as we go on. So what can cause this to happen? Well, if we have dysbiosis, like I said, if we have a lot of bad bacteria, not a lot of good bacteria, it starts to break down that, chemical, uh, that, that barrier, that wall, because our good bacteria help to build up that wall for us. They give us a lot of um, benefit, which we'll talk about later. Um, they keep out unfriendly invaders just by crowding them out. They take up surface area and they just pass them right along the way. And then, like I said, undigested food can start to then come through those little holes that develop. That irritates the intestine, causing immune activation. That whole immune cascade I talked about where antibodies are produced happens, inflammation happens. Diet, medications, toxicants, toxins that are in our environment, and infections, all these things can be pro, or, or can cause this, this process to begin. So this is a little bit of an illustration of how this happens. So we should have these tight little connections between all the cells of the digestive system. What happens, they start to break down, and you see there's little bacteria, there's food, and what's, what's down here? We have our, our circulatory system. 
So it comes right into our circulatory system, whereas before these things would have just been passed through, no big deal, and that's the way the body is made to work. But when this starts to happen and we start to get things leaking in through, it goes through into our circulation, and like I said, the immune system tags it and says, we gotta take care of this. This is that whole process I was telling you about earlier. I know it's small up here. Like I said, we get that, that foreign thing leaking into our intestines, or leaking through our intestines into our circulation. We get the immune response. We have a re-exposure, meaning the next time we eat that food or the next time we're exposed to that environmental allergen, all of a sudden, the body says, oh, we gotta take care of this. Memory cells, that way it's, it's, not a, it's not a long activation period. It happens very rapidly. With that dietary trigger, inflammation is, is uh, activated. And one of the things that they're finding with this whole process is that not only does it kill whatever that tissue was that came, or the, the food particle that came through, it says, oh, well this little undigested bit of protein looks a little bit like your cerebellum in your nervous system. Or it looks like your thyroid gland. Or it looks like the parietal cells in your stomach. And what happens is you start to get damage to other parts of your body because of what we call molecular mimicry. This is one of the mechanisms that they think, this is why autoimmunity happens. Any type of autoimmunity probably has some role uh, originating within the gut. This is again a nice picture that I took out of a study of a, a doctor, uh, Amarista Vijdani, and he's done a lot of studies specifically on gluten. Who's heard of gluten? Everybody, right? Gluten is one of those things that has been demonized in our society today because, um, well, because of a lot of reasons, but it really is not a good thing to be exposed to in most of our cases because it has a big uh, role in causing this whole process, this whole cascade to begin. So again, this just shows the entire process as it happens, but it starts to say, okay, brain antibodies and prostate and ovaries and adrenal glands and kidneys and heart and even our own immune system begins to become attacked by itself. Um, so it's a very scary cycle, uh, cyclical, and unfortunately a cyclical down uh, type of a problem that people deal with because it progresses. I know I have this one here because what happens when inflammation goes in, it actually makes those holes worse. And so more and more can leak through and it gets worse and worse and worse. So. Malnutrition can, can become a problem because we're not absorbing nutrients. Bacterial overgrowth, yeast overgrowth, food sensitivities and allergies pop up because again, every time you eat that food, maybe it's not that it goes in and starts to kill, you, kill your thyroid or your, your brain, but maybe you just feel like junk after you, you eat some of these foods. Um, and we quantify that as not necessarily having a, like an anaphylactic reaction, like where you start to choke up and die when you eat, eat certain foods, but more of a slow acting type of an immune response. Um, but and we'll talk about this more, <coughs> immune, immune dysfunction and neurological dysfunction can also come from this process. <coughs> Colon, I know we spend a lot of time on small intestines. And last but not least, category one is your colon category when we look at the metabolic assessment form. So, very common things that you would think of with colon because what does colon do? It deals with water content. 75% of a stool that you pass is water, or hopefully it should be water. Um, so, if there's a, a mess up of that, you can get really watery stools or you can get very dry stools. So we see things with constipation and diarrhea, alternating periods of constipation and diarrhea, uh, but also a lot of, uh, you can also get some yeast types of symptoms be, uh, to express themselves as well. So again, everything uphill or uh, upstream from the colon, which is every part of the digestive system, can affect it. And again, there are other things that happen in the digestive system that are very very bad. We have things, of course, we have polyps, we have different um, adenocarcinomas that can develop pretty much anywhere throughout the digestive system. We have different breakdown that can happen. We can have uh, liver conditions, we can have pancreas conditions that are serious medical conditions. I don't discount that at all, but here's the thing. How do most of these serious conditions come about? It's because these other functional conditions that we've been addressing a little bit here weren't addressed early on. If we take care of those things early on, these things don't happen nearly as frequently, okay? A lot of us, we want to pawn everything that goes wrong with us off on genes, and genes do play a role in our life, but the environment that we expose ourselves to, ourselves to is really what uh, affects us and, and changes us in a negative way or a positive way. I want you to think about that too. So, a system's associated with the gut. It has a hand in everything because, well, let's think about it. If you aren't digesting and absorbing nutrients into your body, 
everything's going to suffer because you'll have no energy. You won't be able to get nutrients into the cells of your body, so you'll pretty much you'll start to die slowly, essentially. Um, but even more so than that, the majority of the immune system is held here within the gut because uh, we have different barrier systems within the body, and the gut is a big barrier system. What that means is that it's supposed to keep stuff out and selectively let things through. I mentioned that to you already. <coughs> but it's very strategically um, positioned because a lot of stuff is exposed in our body through our digestive system. So, like I said, when things come through, the body says, oh, this isn't supposed to be here. It tags it, it gets rid of it. <coughs> so that's the way it's supposed to work, and it should happen that way. It's a first-line barrier system. It responds to invaders. All this little tissue underneath, all those little cells I was talking to you about, there's tons and tons and tons of immune cells in through those areas. So, like I said, the majority of the immune system is here, and gut irritation will lead to inflammation because it is so intimately connected with the immune system here. So, <coughs> this process is happening all the time in our bodies. So, why is it that some people have issues and some people don't? Well, in my mind, one, genes come into play, but two, it's a, it's a looking between acute exposure and chronic exposure because the body should be able to regenerate itself. Just like we talk about in chiropractic, the body is self-healing and self-regulating. It self-heals and regenerates. So the body has all these mechanisms in place. Even the inflammatory cascade is for its protection. But when it just keeps on getting bombarded and bombarded and bombarded and it gets no break, it can't regenerate. And that's when it really starts to become a problem. Okay? So that's where it kind of get that out of your minds that we all have this process going on with us all the time but most of us we're doing okay and we have the ability to be able to come back and and bounce back and our, our body does what it needs to do digestive system and the nervous system and i love this because i'm a neurology diplomate and i was wondering as we we're going through the program why do these guys keep talking about the intestinal system i thought we were talking about nerves but so so very intimately connected here um, gut dysfunction leads to systemic inflammation. Inflammation affects the brain. There is lots of literature out there about this subject and how um, gut more than likely has an effect in all neuro, uh, neurodegenerative disorders like Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, uh, types of dementia. Um, all these things can be affected through that. But even younger in kids, uh, we see things like autism uh, and ADD and ADHD that they think is very connected to the integrity of the child's gastrointestinal system. Neurotransmitters don't just exist in the brain and the spinal cord. We think about serotonin and you know serotonin being the, uh, when you're depressed you have serotonin deficiencies within your body, and that, that could very well be. But the majority of the serotonin in your body is actually circulating through your digestive system. What, so what happens when you take a medication that affects neurotransmitter levels? Well, it doesn't just affect brain, it affects everything. Well, it does affect everything because brain is affecting everything, but um, Neurotransmitters don't just exist in the brain and the spinal cord. They're all over the place. And there are so many neurological cells within our digestive system, they actually call it the third brain. Um, that's how important it is. Um, dysbiosis in the gut environment, they actually think that the bacteria in our digestive system have a role in sending chemical information through what we call the vagus nerve back up to the brain stem and back up to the brain in, in the end game. I know it sounds kind of out there, but that's what the research is pointing towards these days. So again, if you have bad gut, flora, bad bacteria within your digestive system, it's going to start to affect that communication because your body is constantly getting information on this, how much stuff is in my stomach right now. Where is that bolus of food that I swallowed three hours ago and now it's working its way through the small intestine? It needs to know these things. You don't have to think about it because it just happens automatically. But in the same respect, it can start to become dysfunctional and you don't realize it. Um, you saw this whole thing earlier. It's the same process that we were talking about with um, how you can develop autoimmunity <laughs> from leaky gut syndrome, but you can also have nervous system damage other than just antibody tagging because tissue damage occurs with inflammation here. Nervous system damage occurs. Like I said, inflammation very highly goes to the brain and just starts beating it up. And what happens is when we start to get bad firing of our nerve cells. That can lead to a whole host of problems. So, nervous system very tightly tied in. I added this one in because I was doing some reading today in preparation. I prepare right up to the very last minute because I want to give you guys as much information as possible and good information. And thyroid is such a big issue in our society today um, that I felt I had to address this. Gut is very connected to thyroid in that 
of T4, which is one of the, the um, hormones that's produced by your thyroid gland, that's the majority of what's produced. It's inactive. It doesn't do anything for you until it's converted into T3. And T3 is converted, 20% of it's converted in the gut. So if your gut's not working, there's 20% of your, your T3 is already down here. You wonder why uh, autoimmune, or, uh, autoimmune uh, thyroid problems are so big, but also just hypothyroidism in general has become such a problem. I think a lot of it comes back to this. So how do we evaluate the digestive system? We're going to jump through these really fast because they don't need a whole lot of explaining. We have the questionnaires that are in front of you. They can point to some very specific areas because people have done a lot of research and said when people have problems in these areas, these are the types of issues that they deal with. Stool analysis, pretty self-explanatory. It sounds kind of disgusting, but you take a sample of your poo, you send it off to a lab, they do some chemical analysis on it, they dig through it, um, and they look and they say, okay, here's some markers that we look at to see, are you digesting your food? Are you absorbing your food? Do you have a good proportion of good bacteria? And do you not have bad bacteria? Do you have immune and inflammatory markers? And then do you have, like I said, bad things, yeast, fungi, and parasites, um, and bacteria kind of floating around where they shouldn't be? This is an example of the stool test. This is a very extensive test. You can break it down and do separate parts of it. Some people just want to get like a uh, yeast culture. But this is looking at the whole thing uh, as a whole. Um, <coughs> we look at predominant bacteria. Like I said, these are good bacteria that should be there. And they should all be within the green ranges. If they start to get too high, it's not good. If they start to get too low, it's not good. Pretty self-explanatory. These are the pathogens that we can start to see. The bad bacteria, the bad fungi, the bad yeast that shouldn't be in there. And again, are they high or are they low? Then it, they, if they find some, they'll actually go through and they'll culture it and just say, is it sensitive to either medications or is it sensitive to some supplements? And that way you know, okay, if you take this, it's going to kill that and get rid of it for you. Um, this is looking at how well is your body breaking down nutrients and then assimilating them or absorbing them into the body. These three markers here look at, is there some inflammation going on in the intestines? And then the, uh, this one here looks at immunology. It looks at what we call the secretory IgA. Essentially, what's the antibody covering that is existing in your digestive system at this present time? Because there should be a nice covering to, again, take care of those bacteria, those bad yeasts, those bad fungi that come in right away and not even give them a chance to start setting up shop. Um, they look at pH. They look and see maybe you have some bleeding in your digestive system somewhere. And again, they look at digestion and absorption here. Another thing that we can look at, and this is more related to leaky gut, and unfortunately I had a couple videos I wanted to show you guys as you were coming in, the computer didn't work. Um, this is one of them, and it talks about leaky gut, and this specific company runs a very uh, advanced test to look at antibodies to, essentially to your digestive system. Those little connections that should be between all the cells, they start to break. These are the markers that we start to see go up. So this is a blood test that can be done to look and see if you have leaky gut syndrome, if it's not uh, identifiable from the actual questionnaire. And then uh, food allergy testing and sensitivity testing. Essentially what you do, you take someone's blood and you say, okay, this is an antigen of gluten. This is an antigen of um, some other uh, aspect of wheat. This is an antigen of rice. And, it's, and then they look to see, does your body have an immune response to these antigens? If it does, you have sensitivity to it. And it'll grade it on a scale of like one to four if you're mildly sensitive or severely sensitive based on how much your immune system responds when it reacts. So if you're not sure if you're having food reactions, this is a good way to really tell. Another good way to tell in a cheaper way is to do what we call an elimination provocation diet. We're going to talk about this a little bit more, but it's just what it sounds like. You eliminate foods for a period of time and then you add them back in slowly and see does your body react. You say, okay, first day in after I eliminated all these foods for three weeks, I try wheat. Man, I feel like crap. So I'm not going to eat wheat anymore. And it's just one of those things you can do. A couple days later, you try to add dairy in. Hey, I'm fine with dairy. Good. I like to hear that. Um, but then you just keep on adding foods back in periodically. And that's uh, a very basic way to do these things. Um, and again, to be able to tell if maybe you have some reactive foods. So this is the exciting part. And we're, we're kind of coming down the home stretch here. Healing and restoring the gut. Like I said, if disease begins in the gut, then we have to assume that true health also begins in the gut. So you might go through in this questionnaire and you don't score very high in anything, and that's good. But I still like to try and convince people to think about the long term. You know, where are you going to be, you know, a number of years from now?
have kids come in and they're eating, you know, all this junk food and I was there a few years ago, I remember what it's like. But they don't have the same types of reactions, but if you continue on with that cycle, it's going to continue to be a problem. So the time to do something about a future issue is now, in my mind. And I know for some of you, that's a little bit later in life. That's okay. It's still now. It's not later. So we can still make some good changes. The biggest thing we have to do is clean out the junk. That might be the only step you want to take tonight. That might be the only step you ever imagine taking. Uh, you might not even be able to imagine that. But it is, uh, it, it's just astounding what can happen when people start to cut out some negative foods. Not everything. You don't have to go on a strict vegetarian diet or anything like that. Um, just getting rid of some of the stuff here and there can make such a big difference in your health. But we can also do some other things to ensure that you have good gut health because, as we talked about, gut affects lots of stuff. Lots and lots of stuff. Nervous system, immune system, thyroid. It really has a big effect on everything in our body. So we can ensure that we have good gut inhabitants, those beneficial bacteria. Um, stomach acid, digestive enzymes from our pancreas are supported. Gallbladders functioning the way it needs to be. Intestinal permeability, if there is any, we repair that. And we decrease inflammation and don't allow the immune activity to continue um, past where it should be. So the first step of this is what we call a four, or some people call it a five R program is we remove, we re eliminate those, those inflammatory foods. And again, who's heard of paleo diet? Anybody? No? A couple people. Okay. That's another one of those diets out there now that everybody's like, oh, this is the way our ancestors used to eat. Used to eat. And it is essentially, it's, uh, you know, if you can kill it or pick it, you know, it's, it's good for you to eat. Uh, and that's really what uh, the plan that I recommend for people as they go through and do this four-hour program is what, uh, what they do. And I actually have some handouts that... Um, if you're interested, I'll have them up at the end, and you can uh, come by and grab one. But they kind of break down what does that diet look like, so that way you can have a good idea. It is it is strict, and I know because I'm actually going through and doing it right now. Um, so I, I've never done the whole what we call the repair and clear program. I've recommended it to some people, but I want to see what it was actually like, and it's it's pretty awesome. It, it's not easy, but it's it's great. So. Uh, what we also want to do here is support healthy bacteria in the yeast environment, meaning that we want to try and get rid of anything that shouldn't be there. So there's some specific supplements that we'll talk about here on the next page. But like I said, sometimes you need medication. It doesn't always get taken care of by supplemental measures alone. So there sometimes has to be some co-management with a medical doctor if one of these things pops up. And the other thing we want to seek to do here is reduce inflammation. So the products I, I like to uh, um, recommend to my patients uh, I do some with Metagenics and I do some with Apex. Apex does a lot of this type of thing, so does Metagenics, but I've uh, had more experience with the Apex, so I'll talk to you about some of both, but specifically in this one I'll talk to you about Apex because uh, it has a GI Synergy, and GI Synergy essentially has three products in it, and you can see them named here, HPLR, Paracetamol, and Eustinil. It goes through and it has specific um, chemicals, or not chemicals, it has uh, botanicals and herbs and things of that nature that go in and they've been shown to kill bad bacteria, fungi, and um, yeast that shouldn't be there. Uh, I'm sorry, parasites that shouldn't be there. The other thing we want to get into somebody if they're in a really bad state is some anti-inflammatories. Some really good natural anti-inflammatories are resveratrol and turmeric. Um, the, and two of the products that we uh, have are resveroactive and tumoroactive. Uh, but you can get turmeric like in a little capsule. Um, this is the best way I've ever seen resveratrol given. And to tell you the truth, turmeric too, because it's in a liquid form. It's already broken down for the most part. And it's very easily digested and absorbed, as opposed to taking a tablet that you have to then break down and then absorb. Um, half the work's already done for you. Second thing we need to do here is support. We need to support stomach acid, we need to support pancreas enzymes, and we need to support the gallbladder function. So, looking at bile there. These are some of the, the supplements that I recommend uh, in line with that. The big thing you want to see in a supplement is this betaine HCL. Uh, that's essentially hydrochloric acid that you're going to put into your system. Because again, it's not necessarily that you have too much acid, it's that you have too little. You can test this by, you take this product, and does your heartburn get better when you eat? If so, it's not too much acid, it's too little. Um, and then also that it should have some pepsin in it as well. Pancreatic enzymes, um, and what you look for here are proteases, lipases, and amylases, things that break down proteins, sugars, and lipids, essentially. Uh, and most digestive supplements out there, digestive aids, 
have that in them. Of course, we like ours because we know that they've been tested, we know that they've been um, researched very well, and so that's why we, we sell them here, we don't sell other stuff. Uh, and then bio cofactors, and there's biomin and, and lipogen. Those are two things that help you to be able to break down your fats a little bit better, um, and then also be able to uh, support the gallbladder. And I have, uh, I have some of these products up here, so if you have some questions about it afterwards, we, I can show you what we got. And then if you still have other questions, I have a book that has like everything in it you need to know. So um, the third step here is to re-inoculate, or the, um, we're getting new inhabitants back into your digestive system. Probiotics, I know I recommend them to a lot of my patients. I know Dr. Lindholm does, I know Dr. Martins does as well. They're really excellent things to be on just for general overall health because we need to have those good uh, inhabitants in our digestive system. Not only do we need to have the probiotics, the good bacteria, um, but I also like supplements that have what we call a prebiotic. It's essentially food for those bacteria as they're going down. Um, that way they can get in there, they can start doing their work right away. It gives them some support. Um, some of the things about probiotics, uh, I'll talk to you about it on the next slide. These are the two um, probiotics, the two strains that are very, very important to have the lactobacillus and also the bifidobacterium. You'll see that in a lot of different supplements. But, um, and again, seeing the prebiotic. And fermented foods, that's another big thing that is kind of uh, coming back or coming into vogue, I guess I should say. I haven't done much of it myself. When I get some experience with it, I'll share with you guys. But there's tons and tons of information out there on the internet about fermented foods. And essentially what you're doing is you're taking healthy foods, you're putting a bacteria in with it, and allowing that bacteria to grow and you get a lot of bacteria, healthy bacteria, while you're also getting in some good, healthy vegetables as well. So, <coughs> this is the point I wanted to get to, a note about probiotics. There's good bio probiotics and there's better probiotics. The fact that you're getting some um, beneficial bacteria is a good thing, even in, say, your Activia yogurt. Um, but when you look at the, some of the other content that's in there, like sugar, uh, we don't necessarily want those things, even if you have, say, uh, the lower fat version is like, okay, well, how did you make it taste just as good with lower fat or less sugar? There's got to be something in there that's got to give. So, uh, and usually there, there's not that many what we call CFU, colony forming units. When you look at a bottle of what we sell here, we don't sell anything less than 15 billion CFU per capsule. Um, and so that's a lot of bacteria to be taken each and every time. You might be able to find something cheaper at the store, but it might say 4 billion. <laughs> so you have to take, you know, four or five of them to equal the same dose. So that's something to be considering in that. The other thing you have to consider is that, is it room stable? Um, we refrigerate ours just because it helps the shelf life stay longer. Most uh, of these bacteria though, should be able to survive in natural environment because what happens when you put them into a 98.6 degree human, are they all gonna die then? And what good are they then? Or when they hit the stomach acid, are they gonna be able to uh, actually be able to do their job? Are they going to die when they hit the stomach acid? So it's important to have all those those factors accounted for um, and that's why we, again, why we recommend our probiotics and not somebody else's. Fourth is the repair phase and during this we're building that intestinal barrier and also making it so that food is passed through easily. Uh, so the big things we want to look at here, building blocks for your digestive system and for that lining of the digestive system uh, is the glutamine, the gamma arisenol, the uh, aloe, the flavonoids, and I can't say this last one, but it's a, it's a licorice uh, root um, extract. Um, so those are the things that are very important there. Uh, glutagenics is the metagenics version of it, Repairvite, which is what I'm doing right now, uh, is the apex version of it, and that's the caramel flavor actually tastes pretty good. There's a lot of stuff out there. You mix it up in water and it doesn't taste so great. Um, but that's actually a pretty good one. Um, the gastro ULC is also, um, especially for people that have stomach erosions, uh, can be really beneficial for that because it helps to increase mucus production within the system. Bowel movements, we need some fiber. You can overdo it on fiber, so we don't necessarily want to um, go crazy here. You can get a lot of fiber just from the food you eat, but um, sometimes you still need a little bit more, and that's what um, the fiber mint is for. Uh, you see the guar gum in it, pectins, lignans, cellulose, and it also has enzymatic factors in it that you need to be able to digest your food. Last thing you do is, like I said, you reintroduce those foods. You add them back in. Sometimes um, what we do is what we call a repair and clear program, which I'll talk about in a second. And what that is, is it's repair, but then it's also detoxification at the end of it. Because again, those two systems go together very, very strongly. Um, and again, this is the talk I did on detoxification. You can find it on YouTube. 
Uh, it's about an hour long. You guys are, I'm sure I'll have you here about an hour or so. It's about the same length of a presentation here. These are some different uh, things that we use during the detoxification. Ultra Clear is the Metagenics version. Clearvite is the Apex version. And there's another one down here, Ultra Inflamex. Ultra Inflamex is for people that deal with uh, specifically inflammatory bowel diseases, either Crohn's or ulcerative colitis, autoimmunity essentially within the intestines. This has um, been shown in a lot of studies to really help people out with those problems. So sometimes you need a little bit higher level, that's what we need to do in that case. So, uh, and again, that elimination of provocation diet where we then add the food back in at the end, and if our body doesn't react very well to it, we don't eat it anymore. Or we don't eat it for six months, then we try it again and see how it does. If it still isn't good, you should probably just avoid it for the rest of your life, okay? So, the Repair and Clear program, like I said, this is what I'm going through right now. Uh, it's an intense process, but it's a really good process at the same time because there's two weeks of gut healing uh, where you're doing a certain round of supplements. Um, and then there's two to three weeks of the clear part of the program where you're doing more of that liver detoxification. I've done a lot of liver detoxes in the past. I usually do one or two a year just to, just to keep myself healthy, keep myself going. But um, putting the two together is just, just like a big home run, grand slam here. So why would you do this though? Especially if you're like, well, I don't really have that many digestive issues. Why, why would I want to do this? Well, if you regain the health of your digestive system, you can regain your life. People might not even necessarily be dealing with digestive issues, but they're dealing with lots of other things. And sometimes it's just getting that digestive system functioning, and they didn't even know they were having dysfunction. And they start to clear up a lot of these symptoms. It helps to hit the reset button. Who here ate horrible food over Christmas and Thanksgiving? <laughs> yes, I, I know every, every, everybody's hand. So. Um, this is a great way at the start of the year to say, okay, I'm changing some habits. Because these diets, again, are very produce lean meat, um, healthy foods incorporating, and it eliminates all the other junk that we shouldn't necessarily be eating. If you do this for, I believe it's three weeks, you can form good habits. Um, that way you continue. It's not just meant for, you do it for the three weeks and then you go back to the way you were before. It's meant to continue on. And it's amazing the things that you learn going through this. We get so many recipes and we need to put together a book because there's, there's lots of them. So anyways. Um, Optimize health for now and for the future, that's really the main thing that we want to see for people because again, it's not all about the here and now, it's about how are you going to be in the future, your quality of life. People want to know, when I do this, can I still eat? Yes, you can still eat. <laughs> and people are like, okay, so I'm eating like a rabbit, right? I'm eating salads, I'm eating this. I'm... It's not that bad. I'll give you some examples here. This is the clear bite shake. You mix it up in a little bit of water, a little bit of juice, pour the scoop in there. We love our magic bullet. We use it so, so much um, to mix these drinks up, but also to make flowers. Uh, we made some coconut butter. Uh, there's all kinds of awesome stuff that you can make with this. So this is what it looks like. Again, it's not like drinking a, a pop. It's not like drinking anything pleasant necessarily, but you can get it down. And I have some tips in case you need some tips, okay? You get to reintroduce some pretty, or you get introduced to some pretty cool foods. This is obviously just oranges, but what do we do? We took some, we sprinkled some cinnamon on top of them. Ch completely changes the taste of it, and it gives you something new. And I don't, you look forward to these things when you're on the, these types of a cleanse. So it's really a good thing. This is called an ugly fruit. Anybody had ugly fruit before? <laughs> it, it's kind of a hybridization of, um, I think it's a tangelo, a grapefruit, and uh, some type of orange. It's green on the outside. When you open it up, it's got this, it's really, really tasty uh, flesh on the inside. So. Um, during the, the repair program, you aren't supposed to do a whole lot of grains or a whole lot of um, carbs. Unfortunately, rice, which is allowable during the detoxification program, is not allowable during the, uh, the repair program. So what do we do? We rice cauliflower. This is cauliflower and beans mixed together with some oil and some garlic. It really is pretty tasty. You know, and these are things that you can do to supplement whatever it is that you're eating for the main course of your meal. This has been like our bread and butter for this, this uh, repair phase because this is coconut yogurt. You can have coconut yogurt that's fermented. Um, and then we mix in some fruit and then sprinkled some coconut flakes on top. Awesome. You, and again, you, you gotta find the simple pleasures in life. And this is like your dessert at the end of the day. This, this is pretty cool stuff. This was a uh, brunch we had on Sunday. This is, um, not acorns, butternut squash. Butternut squash pancakes. 
Um, I know, interesting, right? And then there's um, a topping on top with strawberries and pears instead of you know your syrup or whatever. Turkey bacon, uh, apples, a little bit of uh, coconut yogurt to dip the apples in, and then two wedges of grapefruit. Not bad, right? And we had some tea along with it. Yeah, it, it really is doable. You gotta have some imagination. This this has been like the mm, we we love this one because during the repair phase you can have um, you can have good quality grass fed beef, and so this is essentially a burger. We put a couple leaves of um, uh, not chard. Yet, Swiss chard on top. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Good thing you got her here. Yeah, it's a good thing I have her. <laughs> You're telling me. And then put a little bit of guacamole on top. Very tasty, and then again, we, we uh, kind of changed the recipe a little bit for the uh, the bun here, but it's again that that uh, squash based type of a, a bread. This is our favorite meal, and this is one of those things that we were introduced to while we were on a cleanse, and we eat it when we're not on a cleanse because it's so good. And it is coconut um, uh, coconut chicken uh, chicken nuggets. It is just that's actually what we're gonna have tonight when I go home. I'm so excited about it. <laughs> um, and then there's a little bit of a dip. You can make just like a fruit type of dip. Oh my goodness, so good. And again, stir, uh, stir fry some broccoli and some oil and some spices. Very, very good. This is when you get into the detox. Again, there's some other different things you can do. This is a, uh, a banana pancake that went really wrong. But again, you, you experiment on these things and you try things. Sometimes they work, sometimes they don't. Um, you can't have eggs on these things. So what's gonna hold this together? Flax meal and water egg substitute. So again, these are little tricks that you find along the way. And again, it doesn't look pretty, but it tasted pretty darn good. Uh, this is a vegetable salad. You can have um, some types of grains during the clear, um, the clear bite part of the, the um, detox. And so this is millet with a little bit of cinnamon on top. Great breakfast. Uh, the big things that you avoid during that in grains are any gluten containing grains. So uh, getting rid of rye, wheat, spelt, uh, amaranth, those types of things. But you can still do rice, you can do quinoa. That really opens up your possibilities a little bit more. Uh, and then these are zucchini, pumpkin, there's like two other like really good things in here, and then blueberries, uh, muffins. They don't set up like a muffin at all. Again, there's no eggs in them or anything, but they do taste good. Avocado chocolate, avocados, some uh, uh, cocoa powder, and some dates. Or, uh, yeah. yeah, dates, perfect. Um, and it makes a really good dip for fruit and things like that. Uh, if you have access to, say, like a, a Vitamix, you can make yourself some almond butter. You can't do peanuts, but almonds are acceptable during the clear phase as well. And this is my favorite down here, well, my second favorite behind the chicken nuggets, and that is you take a rice cake, put some of the almond butter on top, and you put the uh, raisins on top. It's Again, it's like dessert for you on this thing. Uh, kale chips, another thing that we've, we've tried since we were on the cleanse doing your own sushi, vegetable-based uh, vegetable -based sushi. So you have the seaweed type, but then you can also do tapioca because it's from a root. Um, and there you go, you got some nice sushi. If you, that's something you're into, we make our own. Um, and again, you can do lots of stuff with chicken, beans, rice, um, guacamole. Things that we tried to avoid last time we did a detox so were beans and rice because even though they're, they're allowable, they're still not excellent for you to really be filling up on. It's much better to try and favor towards the other things. That's why we did a lot of rice cauliflower last time um, to kind of make up for that. Uh, and again, similar type of thing here, just with a bed of lettuce. So, everything comes down to this point here. Because we talked about a lot of things that the digestive system affects, but a lot of things affect the digestive system as well. So that's why it's so important to know about stress health, stress health immune health, why you need to be exercising, and health promoting diet. We talked a lot about a health promoting diet already. These are some really interesting quotes I've heard, so I put them up here. We're eating things we've never eaten, never eaten before, and our food is eating things it's never eaten before. That's why I said we, when we get the beef, we get the grass fed. When you get the poultry, you get the stuff that's been running around on the farmyard. You know, it might get some uh, some feed here and there, but it hasn't been cooped up in its own feces with a bunch of other dead birds laying around it. So. Um, and that brings me to this. I love documentaries, food documentaries especially, and that's where you learn a lot about these things and like, okay, this is what's going on in agriculture these days and it's not good. And you can make choices again by buying local grown stuff you know where it's come from, um, stuff that says non-GMO on it, um, things that are organic because you know it was grown specially, things that are grass-fed, uh, 
again, free range types of things. Uh, somebody says in one of these documentaries, it says you cast a vote every time you go to the grocery store. You cast a vote for eating this way to die essentially, or you cast a vote to eat to live. And you can do one or the other. And again, the more people that get on this eating to live type of a, a bandwagon, they're going to have no choice but to label things GMO and, and to, to start changing their practices so that they're more in line with what needs to happen. These are some great documentaries I have, and I have them listed for you. If you have Netflix, I think most of them are on there. Uh, Hungry for Change, Fresh, Fat, Sick, and Nearly Dead. This one is awesome to see this guy transform his life through doing juicing. Juicing is a, a really awesome thing, which we're going to be doing a seminar on coming up. I believe it's in June, maybe? No. I think we decided not to have any in June. Um, I don't know when it's coming up, but grab one of the, the little flyers on the way out that has all of our uh, events listed on it, and uh, it has it on there. So uh, a great, great thing. And then Food Matters is, is another really good one. If you want to know more, we do have some information on our website. Last time I taught detox, I started a nice blog, and it lasted about six entries, and then it kind of died off. But um, I'm going to do some work, and I've been taking lots of pictures of the food we've been eating to try and get some recipes out there for you guys to make this transition, this process a little bit easier for you. Because I know it's not easy. You're like, what can I eat? Um, so I know I gave you a few ideas, but I want to give you some more ideas, and I want to be a help to you along the way here. So do the other doctors here, Dr. Martin's Dr. Lynn Holmes. So um, again, we'd love to be able to help you in any way possible and try and make things easier for people to be healthy and not make it difficult. Because I know it sounds difficult, but it is very doable. So. Here it is. What are you guys going to do with this information that I've given you? You have the opportunity to go make some changes in your life, which I highly encourage you to do. If you don't, you got a lot of great head knowledge and no application, and this time is pretty much wasted. So action is required on your part. But not only that, when you see the results of what you get when you live cleanly, you know, this is a great way to be able to spread information to friends and be able to uh, explain to them what happened in your health and your life. So, um, before we finish up here, again, a couple resources. We have our lending library back here, which our thyroid symptoms book is gone. So I have the, the DVD or the CD pack up here. You say thyroid symptoms, what does that have to do? A lot of the stuff I get from here, I get from this, this author because he's just brilliant. Uh, uh, Dr. Krasian and how he breaks down all these different elements of the body. He has another one about your brain which again, I really love this book because <laughs> I like the brain a lot. And then again, uh, Dr. Arden Anderson, and again, I don't have his full book here, I do, just the little primer that I read on it. This was awesome. It's easy to read. There's a lot of technical stuff in there, but it's, it's really a, it makes sense when you, when you read it. So um, like I said, some informational resources, and there's lots more out there. Do some Google searches and uh, you know, knock yourself out. There's tons of stuff out there. So, I appreciate everybody's sticking around here and uh, coming for the class. And uh, what we'll do now is I will open it up for any questions you might have, okay?